Hello, hello, Mordimers here, and welcome to 8th round of Tata Steel 2021, and the most exciting game of that, also very important game, because we all gonna benefit from that, especially the Nidorf players. If you like Sicilian Nidorf, definitely it's for you. If you don't, if you don't even play it, it's still very, very educational. So, without further ado, let's see the game between Magnus Carlsen, world champion, who's gonna play with the black pieces against Andrei Yesipenko, 18 years old grandmaster from Russia, generation of the new uh, grandmasters, young grandmasters, um, very strong player, and now he's going to play against Magnus Carlsen. As you see, there is a huge gap in the, in the ranking, and Magnus Carlsen, after a series of a draws, definitely he will want to crush the, the young grandmaster from Russia. So let's see what happened. We have a Nidorf defense another time. The Nidorf doesn't do really well in this tournament. It lost quite a lot of games. So we have a very typical position of Nidorf. I show you on my channel plenty of times. Now, I show you a couple of um, variations. So, of course, bishop g5 is pos possible, bishop e3 is possible, and so on. Uh, Yesipenko went for bishop e2. I show you that um, once this bishop actually takes under control g4, which in some variations, if this bishop is in on e3, uh, can be very annoying, for example, if the knight jumps to g4. So, that's possible. Uh, in this case, it's of course not possible anymore. And here, instead of playing the main line with e5, uh, Magnus Carlsen goes for the Scheveningen system. So, he set up these pawns in front of the, of the center, uh, and now in the right moment, it's gonna be easier to play d5, you know, opening move. Uh, but of course, it's a couple of moves still um, to make. We have bishop e3. As I said now, the knight, for example, on g4 cannot attack this bishop. We, so we have bishop e7, pretty standard stuff. And now the main line goes for the f4, okay? f4, you can play always. This is the this is the main line. However, Yesipenko went for g4. And it looks like, you know, it's pretty dangerous for black, or at least very double edge. And indeed, this was played plenty of times. Uh, Magnus immediately goes for, for b5, saying, okay, you attack me on the king side, maybe too early, maybe not. I'm gonna attack you on the on the queen side. The king stays in the center, gonna be exciting. We have g5, knight f to d7, and now a3. And now a3 saying, okay, I sacrifice this pawn. I sacrifice this pawn, I don't care about the pawn, Magnus um, take that pawn immediately, and now uh, we have queen d2 by Esipienko, definitely the home preparation by Esipienko, uh, he played that quite fast, and here Magnus Carlsen could go for bishop f6, this was played a um, couple of times, but we have bishop e3, exchanging the dark square bishops, we have queen e3, and now we have a couple of games where black actually played bishop b7. Normal development, very important. Of course, after rook g1, moving the rook from this diagonal, also attacking the pawn on g7, black answered with the g6, and then after castle, the game continued. So this was played, uh, you know, in the past couple of times. We have a couple of draws, so pretty solid system. However, Magnus went for very aggressive queen h4, saying, uh, okay, if you move the rook, I'm gonna attack your pawn on h2. So what are you gonna do? Yesipenko immediately goes for a rook g1, saying if you take my pawn, I'm gonna take your pawn and you don't have anything on the first rank because I always have the bishop on f1, uh, then I'm gonna castle, so you have nothing here. So first we have g6 saying, okay, maybe I'm gonna take it now, and Yesipenko simply castle. He completely doesn't care about that pawn. Why? Because if Magnus takes this, um, this pawn, the problem is after knight f3, where to move the queen? Not many squares. Uh, so queen h5, one of the not many squares now, it at least gives uh, black the opportunity to, um, to go to another side of the board. But now knight d5 threatening already very unpleasant fork and also asking what you're gonna do next. And even if black, if black takes this knight, the problem is that the queen doesn't have the square c5 to, to escape. So now rook h1 and now 
the queen has nowhere to go. Queen g4 is the, the only square. And now you can uh, think for a moment how would you catch the queen in the next move. In the next move, you can actually catch the queen. So if you think, okay, I'm gonna move the rook to g1, not really because the queen gonna come to e4. Um, and the problem is that black is winning because, you know, extra um, piece is, of course, extra piece. So that's winning. But knight g5 is a beautiful move. Not only covering e6, not only covering uh, e4, but also attacking the queen this way. So after queen g2, bishop f3, and and congratulations, we have the queen. So Magnus just realized that his queen does completely nothing here. It's uh, a little bit vulnerable, so he retreat. So now we play Nidorf, extremely sharp variation of Sicilian, where every single tempo counts, and Magnus already made two moves um, to move his queen from d8 to e7. This is going to be a really, really great lesson of how to play or how to not to play uh, Nidorf. We have a 4 Yesipenko just saying, okay, Magnus make these moves, but I still follow um, the main line. So we have a 4, the main idea, Bishop B7, Magnus also, a King B1, just put the King to the safety. And now we have Knight C6, also very normal move. Um, Gary Kasparov said, if you uh, play Nidorf, it's good to have this knight c6 as a counterplay because you know you always have to uh, be very careful about the tactics in Nidorf and this knight c6 gives you some counterplay however this is the time where you should pause the video and find the winning continuation for white very very strong continuation very nice tactic uh, while I enjoy my cup of tea Okay, ready? So, very normal in Nidorf, of course, would be sacrifice the knight uh, and then attack on the on the c7 with some fork or also with the with the knight and the rook uh, on d6. And it's extremely, extremely dangerous. But there is something more important in this position. Open diagonal, this diagonal, and unprotected rook on h8. And this is what Esipenko spotted immediately. Now, uh, he went with the knight, but c knight, it only works with the c knight, and uh, you will see why. Knight c to b5, and now after a takes on b5, uh, of course, the knight b5 doesn't work. If we have this knight b5 sacrifice, uh, attack here, attack here, it doesn't work. Magnus can just simply castle, and even if white gonna win another pawn, uh, simply knight f6, let's say e5, knight d5, the queen has to move somewhere, and so on. So, black has, you know... Uh, the piece, the whole piece extra for two pawns. And let's say that the position of white king isn't that safe uh, when, you know, you don't have the, the pawns. The A, B and C pawns are vanished. So uh, black would have, you know, extremely comfortable game here and attack of the, on the position of the, of the king. So this would not work. However, here, this is what you had to spot is knight c6, knight c6, and now everything works as a charm. Magnus is forced, because now the, the queen is, of course, under attack, so it's forced to take, and now we're gonna have queen c3 with the uh, double attack on this rook and on the bishop, so bang. So congratulations if you found it against Magnus Carlsen, that was the, that was some achievement to, to find the tactics, you know. You think Magnus um, gonna play uh, something really crazy strong and then you have to react but yeah uh, Andrea Yesipenko just found it so we have a castle by Magnus and now a queen c6 uh, and here Magnus told for a while he's in the in the really really difficult position if you count the pieces the material is equal however of course this pawn gonna collapse or this pawn gonna collapse so it seems like white won one pawn but this is only one pawn against world champion so uh, it looks like he can hold some how uh, but it's very very difficult uh, but also white have to be extremely precise and imagine you are 18 years old you play against the world champion uh, so you are shaking literally even you have better position is a you know a huge 
injection of the adrenaline and you know sometimes you can be too excited and make a, a simple mistake and Magnus was in the positions like this you know plenty of times uh, he played d5 now blocking the queen from escaping saying okay um, I lost a couple of pawns anyway so uh, if I lose this one doesn't really matter we have e takes on d5 and only now rook f to c8 and now the queen uh, cannot go uh, you know on this diagonal cannot go back what to do with the queen so there are only two good moves uh, and queen b7 it would be a little bit risky to play against Magnus why because now queen c5 and Magnus gets all of this attack finally and it's very difficult to play now so for example you play something like c3 and now your queen is under attack what are you gonna do with the queen you can go for example to a6 but you're gonna get very passive position here okay uh, black gonna take this pawn and so on uh, or you can take the knight which is also very very uh, tricky because after rook c7 uh, the queen has nowhere to go so what you have to do is d takes on e6 and after rook d7 the position according to the engine is better for white but would you like to play that against the world champion uh, where you don't have the queen and uh, it's a little bit risky yes your pawn is a powerful pawn um, and magnus gonna have uh, the problems he have to move the rook to the passive position and so on so probably white gonna win but there is um even a better move which Sipenko played uh, absolutely the best move d6 and now the problem is magnus cannot just exchange the queens because uh, after rook c6 d takes on e7 what you gonna play next your knight is under attack if the knight moves to f6 just to cover uh, e8 you are in trouble so rook d8 wins the game uh, it attacked the the rook you cannot bring another rook there because of course we have a check so you are forced to take it and white is promoting and winning the game uh, you have to play something like rook c7 but it's not much better because now bishop b5 and the knight is attacked twice so if the knight moves we're gonna have the same problem uh, if not then we have of course the knight is lost so rook d7 rook d7 and at the end as you already see white gonna have extra bishop so it's completely winning as well so you don't have the comfort of choice magnus went for queen d8 which is the best move in the position still keeping um, the queen on this diagonals um very very important and now um, the queen is under attack so we have queen b5 and now rook c to b8 saying hey your queen um should move somewhere where to move the queen it's very tempting to exchange the queens however how you gonna uh, now defend that's gonna be very very tricky let's say you play something like b3 uh but then rook a3 you're gonna have some sacrifice here even if you try to start to run with the with the king uh it's just too slow because now queen e3 says hey you shall not pass uh and at the end you just gonna get uh, checkmated you can just choose where you're gonna get checkmated uh, but it doesn't really matter so uh, one of the options would be queen d3 just to cover this a3 uh, which is okay and another idea which Yesipienko played is queen c4 he has to be extremely extremely precise now we have rook a3 so Yesipenko gave the pawn back but what he achieved is actually locking the queen now of course Magnus doesn't want to exchange the queen so he played queen e8 uh, and now we have rook g5 so the plan for Esipenko is pretty easy he wants to exchange as many pieces as possible as this pawn is just a monster so we have rook e4 uh, Esipenko tries to exchange the rooks but now the rook goes to b4 so now we have the attack on the on the b2 we have b3 so the sacrifice now is not possible because the queen is on the very 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 passive square so what magnus has to do is find a way for the queen to get out uh, and try to help to attack on the position of the king how to do that first magnus uh kick the queen uh so queen has to move and now we have queen d8 so the queen um gonna enter the game 
we have now bishop f3 saying, hey, I'm gonna move the, my bishop on this diagonal cover, especially a8, uh, and now, for example, if black would like to bring the rooks to the open a file and deliver some checkmates um, here, uh, that's not gonna be possible. So this bishop is extremely strong now, uh, while the knight is just a blocker. But we know that knights are very often are uh, very strong blockers. For now, the rook is under attack, so rook before and now queen c7 again saying, hey Magnus, your queen and uh, not gonna, you know, leave. But Magnus say, okay, now I have the freedom for my queen on the dark squares on this diagonal. And we have queen f6. Looks like very, very dangerous because now sacrifice on b3 means that we're gonna deliver a rook and another uh, another rook uh, gonna deliver the checkmate on the b2. So what to play with white? Imagine now you have, you know, uh, Magnus Carlsen here and you have to find the move which is not losing. It's an extremely sharp position still. Uh, Magnus is losing but fighting to the end. Uh, you see Penko played rook ace 8 saying, hey, Okay, now you cannot sacrifice, very simple, because your another rook is pinned to the king. So we have rook a8, we have bishop a8, uh, and now queen f5. Queen f5 by Magnus. So my Magnus literally says, uh, you can take my knight. Uh, and I'm gonna take the pawn on b3 because now this pawn is pinned. So Isipenko, of course, has to be very precise here. King b2. Uh, and now what to do? Uh, move the knight somewhere? It it doesn't really matter. You don't have any moves, good moves here. Because after, let's say, knight c5, d7 is coming and then d8 and then this game over. So you have to sacrifice the knight and it's completely losing, of course. And if you play something like knight a4, trying to attack king a3, you're gonna lose one of these pieces. Uh, also, you know, d8 is coming, promotion is coming, it's lost. So this is why we have rook b5 by Magnus Carlsen uh, saying, okay, you can take my, my knight. Um, Yesipienko took the knight immediately uh, and now we have rook c5 going after the pawn. Um, it's a bit tricky but not really. Yesipienko just calmly go for the rook c1. Still have to be very careful because the queen and the rook still can be very dangerous. And now I, I was surprised. Okay, Magnus uh, could just resign in this position uh, or he could go for some tricks uh, like let's say queen f6. Of course, c3 uh, solves all the problems because then the if the, if, if the queen uh, tries to, I don't know, or maybe this way uh, or whatever, tries to attack here, uh, white simply bring the rook to c2 uh, and we're gonna have th this shelter for the king, which is, which is, you know, a very, very strong and the rook and the queen cannot just force that, okay? So, uh, in the next moves, of course, um, white would play something like a queen e8 and um, make another queen and win the game. Uh, however, if king b1, that could be very tricky. What would you play with the black pieces in this position uh, to make it as tricky as possible? It seems... If you play immediately uh, rook a5, then of course queen c8 comes with the check, then c3, uh, and this pawn on c3 uh, gonna be covered here. Uh, so not big risk here. However, very interesting move is queen c3. And now there is the question, how would you now uh, continue the game? So uh, I try to make this as much attractive as possible. I could, of course, end the, end the game very soon. Two more moves, Magnus just resigned. But what if this happens? What would you play in this position? Pause the video and find the winning continuation for white. While I enjoy my cup of tea. Okay, ready? Almost everything is winning, of course, except queen e8, which is obvious move. This is not winning. So now this is very tricky. King g7 is obvious move. Uh, and now this rook gonna come to a5. We're not gonna move um, the pawn because it's blocked. And we're gonna have the checkmate. So not much can be done here. Queen a4 is is forced. And then after rook a5, the best what white can do is bring the, the bishop to c6 and after exchanging uh, we're gonna have this position which is gonna be extremely difficult to win uh, by white 
because black have these four pawns uh, and once the king for example you know controls um, the eight it's not that easy actually to navigate with the rook and this bishop is also stuck over there to take care of the pawn uh, so probably the engine says zero zero this is the this is the draw but you know this is still very very tricky position so after queen c3 what white have to play is queen d8 an important thing is to take care of this uh, square on a5 because now after king g7 we safely can play d7 which is winning because now rook a a5 and we're gonna have this position okay now rook d1 and of course uh okay black can block uh but then we're gonna have c4 c5 and so on even if king is coming to help then uh okay now the, the the bishop is hanging uh but the problem is the queen never can move from here okay if the queen moves uh white immediately gonna sacrifice um the rook and this queen the new queen uh, and white gonna win with the extra bishop this game without any problem so uh queen f6 could be very tricky but only if the the king b1 is played uh magnus didn't go for that he played queen f4 now we have queen e8 obviously now it works king g7 d7 and magnus resign uh, he resigned but if he played this couple of moves i think he should make one more move in this position and go for queen e5 he said a maybe try maybe he should say the b and he should resign when we have c3 that's my opinion however this is uh, also you know respect to andrea yesipenko uh, who went for this rook to c1 so the intention is clear that after the the c3 uh, the rook gonna come to the to the c2 and gonna secure the second rank and everything will be fine with the position okay so um that is the that was the idea this is why magnus carlsen didn't go for that but for us we can learn something from that so um of course c3 is completely winning and we can resign however king b1 now is very very tricky for your information white is still winning but very very tricky way rook a5 and what you're gonna play now because your queen is on the light square here and is completely stuck over there now the thing is the only way to stop this this checkmate of course is c3 then we're gonna have queen b5 another checkmate is coming so the king has to be moved and after queen a6 uh, we're gonna have another checkmate so you can pause the video now uh, and try to find you know another uh, way how to win this with white is only one way to win while i enjoy my cup of tea one more time Okay, ready? I try to make this a short game as educational as possible. We already know that in Nidorf every tempo uh, matters. Uh, but also, you know, this end game is a very, very tricky. Now, if you just create the queen, then congratulations, you just lost the game. Because now we're gonna have rook a2 with the check. Uh, rook a1 king c2 and now not queen a2 but rather queen e2 and queen e2 is winning the only move is queen d2 and we're gonna have a completely winning game the checkmate is coming in the next move so that was the trick the only three moves which are winning for white is delivering the check sacrifice the queen this is the only way we're gonna play now why because now we're gonna promote to the queen uh, and we're gonna have one extra tempo which is very very important because now we have time to play c4 and make a space for the king okay so of course a uh, black can take the the bishop and equalize the material even black has one extra pawn the problem is that after exchanging everything uh white is simply winning because after b4 these two pawns gonna be faster than any of two pawns of the black pieces or even one pawn so for example a five and these pawns already have two extra tempi and also gonna get one extra tempi when attacking the rook so for example b5 f4 um, c5 of course supporting would be even slower uh, so let's just show this f3 b6 f2 uh, and now after b7 the rook has to be moved 
So of course, if the rook comes to f8, and even if this is pushed, uh, then at the end, the rook gonna end on f1, and white gonna promote and win the game with the queen. And if rook b8, we gonna simply have c6, uh, e5. And here is the moment where I would like you to pause one more time, okay? This is, this is very important. What would you play with the white pieces? I'm gonna enjoy my cup of tea, uh, but this is, you know, end game trick. So um, this is also a very, very important lesson. Okay, uh, ready? If you play c7, you, congratulations, you lost again. The, the completely won game, you lost again, because now we're gonna have rook b7 with check. You don't want to come with the king, of course, to the c file because you're gonna lose. Pretty simple. So king a3, and now black can simply sacrifice. And it doesn't matter what you're gonna play. Even you come with the check, the king gonna come to f6. And now this pawn, uh, of course, gonna support and win the game. So that would be disaster. Uh, the move we have to play here is just take care of that pawn. And after, let's say, rook f8, then, of course, this is completely winning. Uh, because black is just too slow, too slow. Queen f8 with tempo. Uh, now we're gonna have promotion with tempo. And doesn't really matter what the next is played. Black still needs two tempi um, to do anything. This pawn's gonna, gonna collapse and the game would be lost. So very, very interesting position. I try to make it as educational as possible, but after D7, uh, Magnus Carlsen didn't test Andrei Yesipienko anymore. Uh, he believed that C3 gonna be played. This is why he resigned. So I would like to also show you the, the standings. So here we go. After another game won uh, by Alireza Firuzia, he is now a sole leader. So in the first round, he lost to Magnus Carlsen. Uh, even he had the good position, but but he lost to Magnus Carlsen. Magnus Carlsen started really well. Alireza Firuzia started really, really bad. But he won against uh, Jan Krzysztof Duda. Then he won against uh, Pentala Hare Krishna. And he is a sole leader, five and a half points um, after eight rounds. Uh, second place, we have Anish Giri, Andrei Yesipenko after this win. Jordan Van Forest, very, very solid. And Fabiano Caruana with the five points. Nils Grandelius are still doing pretty good, four and a half points. And then we have Magnus Carlsen and Pantala Hare Krishna with the four um, uh, points. So this is what is going on. And if you like this video, press like if for some reason you don't like it, press unlike. And if you don't want to miss other games from um, Tata Steel 2021, Press subscribe, smash the bell button, thanks for watching and see you in the next one.